Yeah. So let's go ahead and begin. And um, again, I'm so excited to have this opportunity to um, ask you questions and to interview you and just to talk about Equity Live, which is, or you just, why don't you begin, uh, either one of you, Dr. <coughs> or Reverend uh, Sheila, and tell those who are going to be watching this live stream, what is Equity for Women in the Church? Equity for Women in the Church, and I'm Reverend Sheila Schultz Ross, and happy to be here with Dr. Aria, fantastic clergywoman of God. Equity for Women in the Church is about ensuring that all women across cultures, ethnicities, they have an opportunity to become senior pastors in diverse churches and, and to make sure that the patriarchal mindset does not remain because we as women of God are called to be senior pastors. And I want my co-chair Jan to to, to join in with me right now. Jan? Yeah, well, we have this big vision, a uh, big mission. Uh, we're a movement to facilitate equal representation of clergy women in multicultural churches yes. in order to transform the church and society. And to do this, we are uh, recognizing the intersection of racism and sexism that impede clergy women. And so we're wanting to dismantle this. Uh, we partner with the Gathering a Womanish Church. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Harry, you're one of the co-pastors. And I, I love y'all, uh, you uh, have as one of your mission priorities, dismantling PMS. Patriarchy, <laughs> misogyny, and sexism, and mm -hmm. your racial equality and LBGTQ equality. And so you see the intersection of this. And from the very beginning, uh, and you can tell about your dream uh, at the beginning, Sheila, because you saw this intersection. When yeah. I was in, and Dr. Ari, we know that you're going to guide us through this. <coughs> Excuse me, my sinuses, everyone. I'm in the Northeast, but I still have sinus issues. So pray for me regarding that. But while I was in seminary, yes. I attended a seminary that was um, racially diverse, um, gender-wise. It was, you know, women faculty, men faculty. But amongst my seminary fellow seminarians, yes. they kept saying, "We don't think you're going to ever become a pastor of." A church. Wow. Why? Because I was of the Baptist faith. The seminary that I attended was a Methodist seminary. Okay. And women had a better chance to be appointed as um, senior pastors or elders <clears throat> in the church. Yes. And in my second year of, of seminary, in my MDIT program, I literally said, how dare they think the God that we believe in I will be trained and whatever. Why should it stop me? But the reality was I, I, I would not be called as a pastor. So I put together this vision of what it would need, what, we, what it would take in order to address the inequity regarding women and particularly women of color um, as a project for my MDiv program. And I was told that it was a D-men, D, a doctorate of ministry program, so that it was too much, too much in the endeavor for our MDiv program. So I still worked on it during my entire four years in the MDiv program. And when I graduated, I became a part of the Alliance of Baptists. Mm -hmm. And I presented this dream, this vision, because how dare people say you won't have the chance or the opportunity mm -hmm. to become senior pastor with work, with prayer, with training, with whatever. I just believe to the end, even in my graduation and with my seminary, I wasn't placed or, or promoted for a, a, a church. I still believe that with the dream that I had in mind, it could address the inequities 
as it relates to women in ministry. And you I was know, in seminary. You know, Reverend Sheila, as you were talking about your dream and 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 resisting the the no's that you were given, <laughs> you sounded like um, uh, something I heard this past weekend. I watched. I went to see the movie Harry. Yes, I can't and, wait. And to were, see. Oh yeah, and well, I'm not going to do a spoiler alert. <laughs> but but there were there were a couple of times in the movie where you know Harriet had this big dream of freeing enslaved people, right? And mm -hmm. and people were telling her. One guy in particular was telling her, "You can't do that." And I and, and there were a couple of times where she said, and she gave him the hand. She <laughs> said, "Don't you tell me what I can't do." Thank you. That's what you sounded like as you were talking about. Don't tell me what I can't do. And so with that, so that's amazing to me that in your MDiv program, you created a project that was really D-Men work. Yes. And you didn't stop. You kept, you kept uh, massaging that and working yes. on that, right? And yes. so how did equity, the organization Equity for Women in the Church, how did that begin? As I alluded to, I became a board member of the Alliance of Baptists. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I presented it to them. I, I had all of the, well, not everything, but I had a lot of things outlined what, how equity, what the purpose of equity. And at one point, there was a committee within the Alliance of Baptists called Women in Ministry, but it's much more than that. So I remember doing working with um, doing, oh, Jan, what is it called? Um, when we have at the Alliance of Baptists, and I was so disappointed. Do you remember there was a, uh, a community in the Alliance of Baptists? There are communities where people bring issues up and work on them. Well, my first year <clears throat> with the Alliance, I asked them if I could be a part of the community of women in ministry. And Dr. Ari, only two women showed up wow. at that community. I was so disappointed, but I kept going forward. And they didn't want their identity attached to the community because they were afraid of the repercussions. So I still moved mm. forward. I, and Jan was supposed to come and be a part of that community. She wasn't co-chair. She just wrote me this beautiful email saying, I have been looking for this, but I can't attend the Alliance of Baptist um, <clears throat> gathering. So therefore, just know that I'm interested. Dr. Irie, when I got home to, at that time I was living in North Carolina, uh -huh. I contacted Dr. Jan Aldrich Clanton and I shared with her how disappointed I was because no one showed up to that community. Wow. But what I did, I asked her, I said, let's move forward with this. And I want you as my co-chair. She said, no, I'm, I'm, I, I just want to be a part of the committee. I, and, and we have to be transparent by things. Why, um, Jan is white, I'm black. And I shared with her, there are some places that you will be able to walk into as a white female clergy person, some places that I can walk into, but we as a black female clergy, but we, we are equal and we're going to work together on this. And I, 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 I'm not inviting you as a co-chair to affirm or confirm me, but I'm, I'm asking you to be my co-chair so we can work on this together. And for one year, we put together the overall mission, what our goal was, our objectives, and then I took it back and I'll be quiet, but Dr. Ira, I can, you can see I'm excited about this, how it came about. I. I brought it back to the Alliance of Baptists and it was it, for a calling for the membership to support. Okay. And with $1,000, I believe it was that the Alliance of Baptists allocated equity for women in the church became a community. Wow. And the following year, we had Jan and I, Dr. Jan and I, had people to attend that community. And I'm going to be quiet and let Jan pick up because out of that, we had an initial 
conference at Wake Forest Divinity School. Jan, I got excited. I don't want to take anything. From you. Well, no, I, I, you, you are really exciting me about this because I and I remember that initial phone call with you, Reverend Sheila, and uh, y'all can all tell how persuasive and how passionate <laughs> Reverend Sheila is. And at first, I was saying, "Oh, you know, I just want to serve on it," but. Then I think the spirit spoke to me and reminded me of a dream I had had when I was a, a newly ordained minister, Baptist minister, uh, one of the first in the state of Texas, one of the first Baptist women uh, ordained and uh, not able to find a place of service in the Baptist church and this Methodist church invited me to be associate pastor. Then I was a chaplain in Waco, but I had this vision uh, that even before the terms white privilege and intersectionality <clears throat> were common, there was something on some level that I knew the connection. And in fact, uh, the Waco Tribune uh, reporter interviewed some ministers there in Waco about our New Year's resolution. And I said, well, mine is to uh, dismantle racism and sexism. <laughs> and it's pretty big. And then they came back to me the next year and said, how's I doing on that? Said, well, I have a little ways to go. But, but anyway, uh, so uh, I had this dream of planning my own church, as Dr. Irie says in sermons many times, if they won't give you a place of, at the table, just create your, make your own table, set your own table. So I started conversations with this African-American pastor, male pastor, Baptist, uh, about uh, co-pastoring and creating this church. I became an American Baptist uh, church planner, and he was too. And our conversations were moving along with enthusiasm and respect. And then I noticed that he kept saying, uh, well, I will really uh, appreciate if you assist me in preaching and assist uh -huh. me in this and assist uh -huh. me. In, and I said, oh, uh, wait a minute, I mean co-pastor, okay. and, and, and he just didn't get it, and so anyway, we, we, well, he part, got it. we part of the state. <laughs> he got it, he didn't want it. He did not, yeah. okay. But he got it. Yeah, but when Sheila called me, the spirit brought back to my memory that this was the way my dream uh, and calling would be fulfilled, okay. but it would be with an African-American woman at this point in history, not with a male. But I had to recognize to begin with it that Sheila was two down in privilege. I was just one. I had the white wow. privilege. Wait, 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 wait. Two down. I like the way you <laughs> phrased that and characterized that, Dr. Jan, that Reverend Sheila was two down in privilege and you yeah. were one down. So you got to unpack that for us, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, with, with the African-American male, and this may be very naive, but I thought we're both one down in privilege. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And so that would be an equal. But then with an African-American woman pastor, I realized that she had... Uh, well, and still did have those obstacles of racism and sexism, whereas I only had the obstacle of sexism. Yeah. And so we began with that understanding that I did have that white privilege and that we would work and I would have a lot of work to do to make sure that our co-pastoring of equity for women in the church, co-chairing, was actually equal, that it wasn't going to be a default white privilege. You know, Dr. Jan, um, you, you really impressed me with, when you said that you realized you had some extra work to do. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't Sheila's work to do. And, and I've learned that even more at the gathering as a ministry partner at the gathering. Uh, it's white women's work to do. We can't expect black women to educate us or to always call us out, but we need to do the work, the reading and the understanding. Thank so. you so much for saying that. And and, and so, giving up, Dr. Ari, yes. let me add, just to, to tag on to what Jan has yes. said, it's giving up a privileged safe place. A privileged safe place. A privileged safe place. 
-hmm. And that's hard to do. I, I, I can understand it, but it's a must. It's a given if we are to, to address the issues of sexism and racism. I had to put that out there. And you know what? Uh, I posted on my Facebook page, I think it was last week. <clears throat> I read there was an article out and it was talking about can, can black women and white women be friends, <laughs> have friendships. And the, the, the essence of the article really was what the two of you just described that there has to be an awareness, particularly on the part of the white person in the friendship of their privilege, and not just the awareness of their privilege, but an intentionality of even sometimes uh, rejecting and acquiescing um, and giving up some of that privilege, right? Yes. And doing some extra work, right? Yes. <clears throat> and, um, and so you, the two of you, seem to demonstrate that really beautifully. Thank you. It's, yeah. in, it's intentional. It's yeah. intentional. It's and, 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 and we provide, Jan and I provide pastoral care and support to one another in a confidential manner. And, and that's important because not all the time women will support women. That's correct. I have been in situations where white women have not supported me, but I have been in situations, I'm going to name it, where black women have That's not right. supported so, me. Yes. So therefore, and I'm sure <laughs> it's the same with Jan, but when we can come together and, and, and tell one another, hey, this has happened to me. You know, do I have a chip on my shoulder? And it's not a chip, it's a reality. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. How can I address it? What must I do? But let me cry in your arms first. Mm -hmm. Provide me with the, the, the pastoral care. Engage me to move forward and to keep on fighting and advocating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Jan, at the beginning of our conversation today, you, I think you shared the mission of equity for women in the church, but could you do that again? What is the mission of equity for women in the church? And, and let me say this, equity for women in the church is a nonprofit organization. Yes. Right, right. And that happened in that uh, Wake Forest meeting. Uh, by the way, I would want to uh, say that Reverend Sheila's dream of that Wake Forest conference uh, she held on to it with passion. <laughs> she knows how to not only dream big, but to provide the strategies like uh, <laughs> in your coaching dream big program, Dr. Irie, she really has that down. And she told me at one time, we're going to have this conference at Wake Forest, whether it's just the two of us, <laughs> uh, we're going to have it in October of 2013. Yes. And he just believed it into reality. We raised enough money to bring people uh, of various uh, races, denominations, genders. It was very important for us that we pay people's way so that that would not be an impediment. Finances sometimes make uh, conferences not very diverse because we can afford it. So we brought all these well, wonderful people, and out of that, uh, we did decide to become a 501c3 organization, ecumenical, and our big mission is to uh, or dismantle sexism and racism, but to uh, have equal representation of clergy women, uh, because we believe that will uh, transform church and society. And we, we say of multicultural or intercultural churches because uh, we have our statistics show that women of color have a much harder time of, uh, well, women uh, in general, uh, there are about 40% who are graduate, 40% of the seminary graduates are women but only about 10% find pastorates in Protestant denominations. But in many denominations, women of color especially, it's, it's lower than 1%. And the salary- In mainline churches, in mainline churches, particularly- Right, in right. and the salaries are lower, even though the clergy women are much more likely to have seminary degrees. And so we, we uh, 
form the organization. We got strategies and projects, and we can talk about some of the projects that we have. Uh, so it's a big dream, but we also have steps that we're taking, and this Equity Live is one step we're taking to try to get it out there and actually change the culture of churches so that there will be uh, more receptivity. And it, it has to do with biblical interpretation. It has to do with you know, this male-dominant culture. And so what are some of the ways that equity for women in the church goes about um, creating uh, this new way of being church? What are some of the ways you, you fulfill your mission? One, I'll talk about one program and then the vision of other programs, Jan. Um, you can come in. The one program that we are so grateful for and, 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 and proud of calling in the key of sheep. Mm -hmm. That program is about teaching younger kids or, or kids, males and females, calling in the key of sheep. What does that mean? We are called and it doesn't have to be a male calling in the key of sheep, mm -hmm. educating um, young kids, going the patriarchal issue, why we are created in the image of God and God is neither male or, or female. And if you can see God as he. Definitely, you can see God as she. And one of our board members developed this program, Andrea. Oh, what's Andrea's last name? Um, Chambers Clark. Yeah, Chambers Clark. She, Clark. She, she, she developed this program, and it is wonderful. And it truly changes mindsets of how you can go into churches, into institutions, and challenge people to look at how they perceive God and the damage that that's that that it's doing to little girls and yes. boys yes. because it's promoting sexist attitudes among the little boys and it's showing little girls that you can't be everything that God called you to be because you are female. So the training is developed by Andrea Chambers. It's wonderful. It takes you through the steps it, uh, steps of patriarchy, what to look for, for, from everything to issues in the Bible that relates to patriarchy to commercials. Mm -hmm. Just simple mm -hmm. things. And to give strategies as to, there, hold it up, Jane, Jen. Hold it up, call it in the key of sheep. To look yeah. at strategies to implement change. Jan, you pick up. You pick yes. up. Uh, you know, Reverend um, Andrea Clark Chambers uh, came up with this uh, creative title. I just love it, uh, calling the key of she. And uh, she sees that starting with yep. boys and girls at an early age is so important so that they don't have to unlearn these sexist and misogynist and distorted biblical interpretations. And so uh, through education, uh, through uh, events, uh, in fact, we have had now uh, four calling in the key of she events. We had t uh, one here in Dallas at Perkins. Uh, we've had two at Memphis Theological Seminary. We had one in Austin. Uh, we connected uh, sexism and uh, exploitation of the earth because those are uh, connected uh, uh, very uh wonderful eco-womanist scholar, Dr. Melanie Harris led that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're trying to educate uh, leaders so that they go into the churches and change the uh, culture so that it's not patriarchal, uh, so that uh, young children see women in the pulpit too. Uh, I think it was uh, Marion Wright Edelman who said, you can't be what you can't see. And it's so important uh, for these children to uh, hear uh, from a woman pastor for the language and the leadership to include females. Mm -hmm. So- and, uh, and the litany, Dr. Jan, and mm -hmm. the litany. Yes. Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And um, I will go ahead and say this because before we um, started, Dr. Jane, you had posed a question to me of what was it that um, compelled me to be a part of Equity for Women in the Church. And I will tell you, first of all, it was the title, and I don't know how I ran across this <laughs> title. It must have popped up on my Facebook feed or something. But I was impressed with the title, um, and it just spoke to something deep within me that I had been longing to see, that I had been thinking about, right? What would it look like if there were equity for women in the church, right? What would that look like? So that was like this, this hidden desire that I had to, to see what to, and to visualize that. And so that got me investigating equity for women in the church. That took me to the website, right? That took me to do a Google search. And then what I found was the brochure for calling in the key of she. And when I saw that, and when I, and, 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 and I read it, and I saw the pictures of the women, Dr. Gina Stewart was at one of your events, yes. um, other, other women, and I, and I saw the diversity, and I read what it was about, I was like, this is what I had been looking for. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to be intentional. Yeah. We have to be in, in, intentional. And, and that's how, that is so critical and important. And Dr. Ari, I want you to know it's hard work to try to be intentional. Oh, I know. I know that. And, the, and I'll tell you one more thing that impressed me because at one of your events, one of the um, calling in the she, key of she events, um, I think, I'm pretty sure there was a video of a, a male professor teaching. And, yes. I, and I listened to that and I was like, wow. So it, it's men teaching this as well. Yes. Very important. Um, and so I was just very impressed and it was something that I wanted. I had no idea that I would be asked to be on the board. I was <laughs> just glad it existed and that I could, you know, um, cause I, I think when I, I spoke at an event in Waco, nevertheless she preached and there were some brochures there. I was just happy to get some brochures. Yes, um, and, and it's critical. I, 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 we, we're talking about calling in the Kia She, which focuses on boys and girls, but it's also critical. We're gonna have to implement a program. We're gonna have to get money for a program to, to, to help change the mindsets of males. Because when people see equity for women, they say, oh, the women are doing it. Women are doing it. But all of us must advocate on behalf of, it can't be a woman thing. It's an all of us all thing. Of us thing. Yeah. Absolutely, which is why I'm excited about these Equity for Live um, live streams, because we are going to have some men that we're going to be talking to, some men that support equity for women in the church, some men that are on the front line, some men who, who are resisting you know, patriarchy and are aware of their privilege and use their privilege in ways that support um, and honor and open doors for women yeah. clergy. So we're gonna be having conversation with those men as with men like that as well. Yes, and, and we have men on our board, our equity mm -hmm. women in church board, our yeah. board. Uh, we not only were intentional in that initial conference, but in forming the board to have diversity of race and gender and denomination. So, uh, yeah. So, so I have another question for you, beautiful women. Why is there still, or is there? still a need for an organization like Equity for Women in the Church? Is it, oh, is it, yes. is it still a relevant concern? You no, know, relevant because I said about intentionality. Number one, we it's important that we just don't have organizations that just focus on promotion of white women in clergy or Hispanic women or, 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 or white women. It's equity for all women. And mm -hmm. even though we're talking about um, clergy women, 
it hits all institutions, you know, right. all, everything. So yes, it's in my opinion, I believe in everyone's opinion, like you, Dr. Ari, and the people on our board and, and Dr. Jan, it's relevant today because we still are not addressing the issues of inequity and there's still a divide, a divide whereas I'm going to advocate for the black woman, I'm going to advocate for the white woman, the Asian woman or whatever, the Hispanic. We need to advocate and find avenues or programs or strategies or advocacy, whatever, how we work together. So that was a long answer to say yes. We need it because there's still a divide. And until we address the divide um, um, that plagues all women, there's still a division that the issue of sexism is not being addressed in the church or other institutions. Yeah, yeah. So, some people uh, would like to think that we live in a post-sexist world, but if you look around in all areas and in all institutions, that is not the case. Uh, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in the church, uh, the Me Too movement has certainly uh, exposed so much uh, discrimination, abuse, assault, and then the Church Too movement uh, followed that as women were uh, empowered to say, you know, I've experienced this in the church, and Equity for Women in the Church has recently uh, issued a statement on uh, sexual abuse and discrimination in the church and how important it is to change the language and the leadership because that's at the foundation of this discrimination and abuse. And so uh, we're, unfortunately, uh, we are still in a sexist, misogynist society. And so we need equity for women in the church, which we believe will reach out to the larger world. Right. And Dr. Ira, if I can even be, if I could be even more transparent, I am in at, you asked the question, where am I located? I'm the senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Pittsfield which is an hour away from Albany, um, New York, and three hours from Boston. My congregation is 95% white. Wow. Yeah, it's 95% white. And, and why is this needed? Because my congregation, whom I love dearly, wonderful congregation, very progressive, they have called uh, African-American female. I'm the 30th pastor and the church has only been around, not only, it has been around since the 1700s. So it's historic. However, I always remind them, this is not all there is to it, you know, to address the issue of sexism and racism. Right. And being transparent is this, my, my congregation is an aging population. So, you have to meet people where they are. And I call Jan sometimes because I feel so guilty. I, I, because times I say he and I want to say she, but it is changing. It's a process. So people who are watching this live stream, I want you to know, don't feel guilty or think that you're not addressing the issue. If you're meeting people where they are and litanies or liturgical, whatever, still remain patriarchal. It's a process. Push people as you can push them with the Holy Spirit guiding. I have introduced some of Jan's um, hymns that have removed the patriarchal labels and many of my congregation members have said, why are we doing this? And I always, it allows me a chance to teach because I go to the scripture that says, God is neither male or female, God is spirit, right. or I, I take them to scripture that, that um, describes God as the mother hen or, or, or a bear or whatever. But please, everyone, don't become so disgusted because you think you're not addressing the, the, the sexism. Meet people where they are and allow the Holy Spirit to take you to even new 
and higher heights. I just wanted to be transparent with that because sometimes I do feel guilty. I'm, I'm the co-chair. You, you feel, you feel, women, you, you feel and guilty. And still, I say he sometimes. Yeah, you feel guilty because you feel like you're not pushing them enough. Yes. You're not pushing the envelope enough. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I yes. Yeah. 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 So, um, so how can you, you talk about that we need men involved in this movement? And I'm going to call it a movement. I'm going to call you. You know, this, this, this push or this desire to have equity for women in the church a movement. Um, how, what are some ways or, or, or what are some ideas that you two might have about getting more men involved uh, to join this movement of dismantling uh, patriarchy and misogyny and sexism? The men who are involved now trying to get their male colleagues engaged. And yes, they are out on the, the, the front line with this, but we're going to need them to, to, to advocate for the men to come in. Because there are many men out there who they have been, have been alienated from their colleagues because they promote advocacy on behalf of women. So therefore, equity, we have to see how we can support them. Yeah. You know, we have to see how we can cheer them on. I don't know how that will look, but we can no longer allow those men to say, well, I'm advocating on behalf of women that's enough. That's not enough. How do we get more males? I don't know how to do that. Well, I, I can I can speak to there is a congregation here in Dallas that I go to sometimes when I'm not um, pastoring or preaching at our at the gathering, which our services are on Saturday. Mm -hmm. I go between two congregations, Central Christian Church on Sunday and Friendship West Baptist Church on Sunday. And Friendship West Baptist Church, the pastor is Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes III. Mm -hmm. And he is a, an advocate of women, of Black women clergy, of womanism. Yeah. Um, consider him a womanist ally. And one of the things that he's doing in his church, number one, they started a gender justice ministry. Oh, right. Where I mean, they were you talked about being intentional. So they were really intentional about uh, putting together and, and um, Minister Danielle Ayers, who is a member there, who is the Minister of Social Justice West, and the gathering co-pastors are on this. So we partner with uh, Friendship West in the gender justice ministry uh, to create it. Right. So so not only do they have the gender justice ministry um or you know where there's a lot they do a lot of stuff right but then or and dr haynes has begun um teaching bible study on wednesday nights and you know what he's teaching on toxic mm. masculinity <laughs> yes yes and i don't always get to go but i watch it on um on the live stream and it is amazing and he's using uh, these last couple of weeks, he's been using a book by, um, I think, Bell Hooks um, and talking about toxic, and he's like, you know, pulling no punches. He's breaking it down, and because he's such a kind and loving pastor anyway, you know, it comes across well, but he's like nailing it. Mm -hmm. And there are men, I heard men in the congregation stand up and say, this is how I was raised. I don't know how to change it. Thank uh -huh. you for teaching this. You know what I'm saying? So those are some intentional things that male clergy can do if they have huh, the courage to do yeah. it. <laughs> yes, yes. You know? yeah. yeah, if they have the courage to do so, um, is, to, is to begin teaching what is toxic. Because patriarchy, misogyny, and sex, that's toxic. Yes, it yeah. is. 
Yeah, and it hurts. Uh, it hurts men and boys. Yes. They might not always realize it, but that is that is so exciting to know that uh, Reverend yes. Hayden is doing that at one of our uh, calling the Key of She events at uh, Memphis Theological. One of the professors did a presentation on toxic masculinity, and there's a little bit of that in a video on our uh, website, Equity for women in the church website but i think that is so important we've even talked about on the board y'all will remember having a, a separate event for men mm -hmm. uh, yes yes because i i really believe that that is so important and would draw more men into the movement and then we're very intentional about recruiting men to serve on the board yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Good, good. But trying to find what's going to be the hook to get men in. Yes, it's advocacy, equity, but there has to be the hook. And the hook is calling them out. That may sound... Well, the hook is calling them out, but having another man to do it. Yeah, yeah they the will hook. listen to a man. Because we've been doing it. We've been calling them out. <laughs> For yeah. a long, for a long time, been calling them out. <laughs> and and y'all know too that there are some men who will advocate because they think it's a justice issue, but they don't see that it's important for them. And I think that's the deeper work for exactly. them to see that they have a stake in it too. Right. And the wonderful, and, and that's the wonderful thing about what I have seen Dr. Haynes do because he he centered himself in that, and he shared how. Um, how he was socialized as a little boy. In fact, he shared the story. Well, I know he won't mind because this is all over the world anyway. <laughs> he live streams everything. But he shared the story of when he was a little boy and his father passed away when he was when he was very young. And he was at um he was at the funeral of his dad, who was a, a well-respected pastor in California. And he had started, he was crying because he was so close to his dad. And all these men were telling him, um, you are the man of the house now. You can't be crying, right? Mm -hmm. So he said from that point on until well into his marriage, he stopped crying. Uh, and then he talked about how toxic that was yes. to not cry, right? So he centered himself. And so I think having men to do those kinds of things, to share how, um, patriarchy has harmed them emotionally and yes. being open and transparent about that. Um, yes. There is also a video that I have used when working with teenage boys and girls um, and it's called The Mask We Wear. Mm -hmm. um, have y'all seen that? That might be something Equity wants to put on, your, on our website. Because yeah. it is a and it's a former um, professional football player who's like six five, big guy, mm -hmm. right? And he's it's like a documentary, mm -hmm. and, he, and and the whole thing is about toxic masculinity. And I'm when I show that video, it's about a two hour video. When I showed that for the first time with a room full of incarcerated teenage boys, mm -hmm. they. They like, they didn't want to leave. They wanted to, because I could only show them like an hour of it because that's the only time I had with them. But it pulled them in so much because they could all identify with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so those kinds of tools, getting those tools out there into the mainstream and out um, to where men, and in fact, when I would show that video, not only were the teenage boys, um, drawn in by it but the guards who were there oh, the men wow. who were there watching it they were like oh my god this is how i was raised yes yes and i always when i have heard that too stories about men don't cry specifically black men yeah. you know they don't cry yeah. and i said well i'm jesus was a person of color. Yeah. <laughs> Let me take you to the scripture that says Jesus wept. 
Yes. So I it's really Christian. Preached a sermon. Do you remember Dr. Jan? Uh, <laughs> a sermon about Jesus, you know, on toxic masculinity. And that's the text that I use exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah that was a powerful, right, powerful sermon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are some 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 things. But I, I I'm with you. I do think for men to get involved, there needs to be more men out front, but sharing their personal stories. Yeah. Yeah. Becoming transparent. Being vulnerable, being yeah. authentic. Because the the lie is right. The lie that we have believed that society has believed and and that patriarchy has perpetrated is that a man can't be emotional right, can't show his emotions of hurt and pain and sadness and grief and mm -hmm. be a man. Yes, yes. Like yes. you're somehow, you're somehow, you know, you're somehow female and that's the worst thing a man could be considered yeah. at all, right? Because clearly there's something wrong with being female, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> terms so, like sissy. Yeah. yeah. And worse, yeah. 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 So yeah, so I do I do think that, and that's why I'm I'm really glad that Equity for Women in Church for Women in the Church has men on the board, and I know we, we have at least one black man, a professor at Perkins, who is yeah. on the board, and I can't wait to interview him. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, Dr. Abraham Smith, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, and and he's writing a blog. Well, he's writing a book on uh, Ida B. Wells, and going to do a blog for us on that book. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll really look forward to your interview with him and yeah. knowing more about his story. Absolutely, absolutely. So what's what's the plan for equity in the in, women in the church in the future? What are, what are a couple of things that equity is working on? <clears throat> okay. hey, well, I take that. I talked about calling the Kia She. You can speak to our dream of our partnership with MTS, and you can talk about that, then I'll add some things. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, another project that has been really important from the beginning is called the Lydia Project from yes. Lydia in the Bible, who formed yes. the first church in, in uh, Europe. And uh, our big dream is to uh, get foundation money. We do have a partnership with MTS on the Lydia yes, Everybody listening may not know what MTS is. What's MTS? Okay, yeah. Uh, Memphis Theological Seminary, we partnered. Uh, we're one of the ministry partners on a grant, but we want to get a grant that's uh, large enough so that we can give seed money to clergy women to start a church like the gathering. And we're, we're going to be specific about that, that it needs to be inclusive in race and gender. Yeah. And... Uh, have an egalitarian structure, leadership and language inclusive, but uh, we uh, learn from the church planners, if you can give seed money for five years until the church gets uh, started. So that's a big dream. Uh, it's amazing what we've done so far without grants, without, but we have had donations that helped us do that first. Uh, uh, Wake Forest planning, but we have done all of these events with volunteers. We've had the four calling the key of she, we had the uh, Wake Forest, we had two events here in Dallas at uh, Metropolitan AME. Uh, we've done a website, a blog. We have so much that uh, because we dream big that has happened with volunteers, but our dream now going forward, and Dr. Ira, you've uh, helped us on this too, in dreaming big and realizing that ministry needs money too. Yes. And so we dream monetizing uh, ministry. Monetizing ministry. Uh, <laughs> and we did a, a GoFundMe and have done very well for uh, these equity live presentations, but uh, this Lydia project is a very big dream that we have. And then Equity Live, 
uh, we have big dreams for that because this gets it out. Uh, mm -hmm. So many people still, you say equity for women in the church, well, what's that? Because, you know, physically we can only have so many events, but this can go all over the United States, yeah. all over the world. Absolutely. And uh, since you took, uh, uh, have been coordinating our social media, Dr. Irie, with our board uh, and our Facebook, Equity for Women in the Church, uh, we have so many members because you invited so many. So you're already getting it out in this Equity Live. That's a big dream uh, of ours to just get it out as widely as possible. Yeah. And staff and, and Dr. Ari and, and, and Dr. Jan, we need staff, volunteers. They're wonderful. Our volunteers are wonderful. But the big dream, we don't need a lot of staff, but staff <laughs> to help <laughs> carry out the mission. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I really, I'm, I'm really thrilled to hear about more information about the Lydia Project because as a church planter, um, I, I can, man, how awesome that would be if, uh, if, if Equity would be able to fund uh, a church, a new church plant for five years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's, I mean, it's rough, it's hard. Yeah, you know, and, and if, if we don't have money, because to really, you know, grow a church and provide the kinds of ministry that our communities need, it really takes full time pastoring. You know, yes. it really takes this notion of being bivocational. It is so yes. uh, it's so exhausting. And yes, it's hard because I, I did it. I did it for for 10 years, right? And it's, I, my mind was always divided, mm -hmm, you know? Yes. Um, and, I mean, and, and you know, so, but, but there are ways of, of, you know, generating income where you don't have to work at a nine to five, but you still need another source of income. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. we, we would really like to be able to give enough so that the pastors could have a sustainable living yeah. and not have to be bivocational. And if yes. we get a really big grant, and we've dreamed big, we've written, you know, million dollar grants. To, so whether it's Lilly, whatever foundation, if we could get a really big grant that would go over five years, I think that we could fund some churches because, you know, at the gathering, Dr. Ira, y'all had a grant for one year, but that's not enough to keep a church, you know, to, to make it self-sustaining. I was just actually running out. It, it, we, we, we maneuvered it. We gave ourselves a little bitty salary, right? And so we were able to stretch it out, And but it's going to end like in July. And so we're just... We're That's praying. Mindset. Well, uh, this is another uh, mindset. Gonna provide. Yeah, th this is another mindset that we have to address when it comes to the church. Equity. Why is it so horrible to talk about money? The church is a 501c3. We're a nonprofit. Our goal is to win souls to Christ. But if we don't have money to sustain the endeavor, how are we going to do the work? Right. For, the, for the past month, I've been preaching regarding um, Malachi 3. Um, how have we, we, we robbed God? And God says to test her, to mm -hmm. test her. So mm -hmm. let's test God. Let's test God and say, okay, we're dreaming big. We're going to still talk about, about money. It doesn't mean that we're not spiritual. It yeah. means we, it's a reality that in That's order funny. to sustain your work, God, we're going to need money. And Dr. Ari, people in ministry, women in ministry should not have to worry about salaries, health insurance, um, um, 401B retirement, I'm because we're out there dealing with people's needs one and jan could attest to this one month i had five funerals five funerals i'm the senior pastor i'm full time but still i had to worry about okay what about the stewardship month 
What about this? What about that? So therefore, until, and yes, people are supposed to tithe. Everyone is not going to tithe. So how are we going to sustain the churches if you're not a mega church? And it, and it becomes very different when you're talking about women clergy. That's right. Because women clergy, I, I was teasing a friend of mine last week who is a, a pastor and she is a pastor with a, with a child, mm -hmm. right? And so she's got all this stuff she's got to do as a mom. Yes. And, as, and, I, and I was teasing her. I said, you need a wife. <laughs> right because yeah, that's that yeah. Yeah. most male pastors yeah have wives yeah so some things they don't have to even concern themselves about yes right. right and so but for women clergy a large percentage of women clergy not all but a large percent are single women yes single women with children yes and and to have to be concerned about paying your mortgage, paying your rent, child care, your car, child, child care, care. All, all of those things, it's another weight. It mm -hmm. is another burden. It is even another source. It's a source of anxiety. As yes, much as we would like to say is not, and that we have our faith, and it, it's challenging. And yes, so for, for, for equity to be able to provide some consistent revenue for women who lead, that, I could get excited about that. That's the next big project. Let's that read. Well, we're, we are excited about that. And we have, uh, I, how many grants have we written? Maybe five or six, but we're not giving up. We're going to look for other foundations and see, you know, where are the money yeah come from and uh you know we're having some success with gofundme too and by the way i'd like to do a pitch pitch right now go to equity live on gofundme or on our facebook page and contribute to Please. endeavor equity live and and if we have good success for this then we might uh try to fund the lydia project yeah. or begin funding through that GoFundMe. Would be awesome wouldn't that be awesome yeah. Well, listen, we've just got three minutes left. Um, so just give us, uh, each of you, give us some closing comments as it relates to uh, your dream for equity for women in the church. My comment is, let us never give up. Okay. No matter how difficult it appears, and, and I become frustrated, and I'm, I, I don't have the fruit of the spirit of much patience. And I stopped praying for patience because you know, God, I believe that God. Put stuff on you, huh? Yeah, never give up. And we will do this. We will do this. And I give it over to Jan. We will do this. I have faith. Jan? Well, and, and I would just say amen to that. Uh, equity for women in the church is where it is because we have dreamed, we have prayed, we have worked it into reality. And we are going to move forward toward these goals. And so uh, we would just ask everybody out there who's watching to support us in any way that uh, the Holy Spirit oh leads you. Uh, mm -hmm. If, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for people to uh, serve on the board, to do other things that could be helpful and supportive, uh, seminaries to partner with. So yes. uh, we just invite you, uh, challenge you. Maybe I'm a Baptist minister giving an invitation. Come join with us. <laughs> this, is, this is a movement, and it's going to flourish. Thank yes. you, Dr. Irie and Reverend Sheila. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. And so you heard the call. If anyone is interested in donating to Equity for Women in the Church, you can go to equityforwomeninthechurch.org. Yes. Dot org, or, or, and make a donation. Um, the co-chairs would appreciate it, as well as all of the women that are going to be recipients of the blessing of uh, this wonderful organization. So we thank yes. you so much for tuning in, for joining us for our first, for our inaugural Equity Live. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.